Neighbors, what's up? It's Cole. Yeah, it's been a little while. Um, sort of a standard thing for me to say these days, I know. Sorry about that. And what's my excuse? I don't have one. I've just been really slacking off lately, but I do hope to um, uh, correct that. Uh, okay, so one of the problems was, um, again, it's not like uh, for lack of material or anything. I just couldn't really come up with anything to really that I really wanted to focus on and talk about. And I came up with some Hellboy. Um, I did an episode a ways back where I simply sort of just did an overview of Hellboy as a series without um, getting into any specific arcs or anything, just sort of saying, um, you know, what I thought of the series in general, uh, things I liked about it, blah, what you can expect to find in it, blah, blah, blah. This time I thought I'd do a specific um, volume. This is one of the newer volumes. Uh, I think the 11th volume just came out a little while ago. This is the 10th volume called The Crooked Man and Others, being... Um, one of those, uh, one of several uh, volumes that doesn't really deal with sort of the ongoing Hellboy arc uh, as far as stuff that really has to do with him personally goes. It's another one of those ones that just sort of takes sort of a, a collection of um, various incidents and adventures that he's had in the past. Um, one thing that I'll just touch on briefly here and say again is if you're not familiar with Hellboy is that it's known for just sort of jumping around. Hellboy has been on Earth since 1944 and uh, has been an agent of the BPRD, Bureau for Paranormal uh, Research and Defense, uh, since 1952. And so any time from 1952 basically on, uh, you'll get various um, stories of, with him in various parts of the world dealing with um, various <laughs> uh, anomalies and oddities and, you know, supernatural things, such as about he's a, he's a paranormal investigator type of types of sorts. Okay, so um, this is a, a one I was very happy with. Um, and it mainly has to do with the main story, The Crooked Man. As far as the others go, I felt a little let down by them, but I feel that the strength of the main story is such that it just makes up for any shortcomings the rest has. Uh, the other stories are, let's see here, we have one that features the, the ghost of uh, Blackbeard the Pirate. What is it called? Great, I'll have to jump ahead here to find its title, sorry about that. I should have marked off these pages. Um, I'm a little out of form, you'll probably notice. Uh, I, you know, I didn't want to cobble together an episode away a while back, even though I had the chance, you know, just to do one and do it half-assed, and, uh, you know, I wanted to be concise and, and sharp and all that, and now I probably seem anything but, but, um, yeah, sorry. Uh, I'm trying here. So, okay, yes, this is called, um, They That Go Down to the Sea in Ships. Uh, so I'll start in the middle here. What's good about these volumes, too, is that you get little intros written by writer Mike Mignola, which always interests me a lot. Where he just sort of says where he was at or what he was doing or what led to the what led to the this story coming into being and, and that sort of thing. Uh, this was uh, originally part published in 2007 and never offered for sale. It was supposed to be a a, a tie-in, I guess, it's supposed to be offered as a free story with anybody that purchased the Hellboy video game that came out uh, from Konami. I always say Konami. I guess it's Konami. I grew up saying Konami, and I can't really get past it. So, um, it's a it's a satisfying enough story, I suppose. Um, one thing that Mike Mignola tries to do is sort of touch on as, as much material as he can, because there's simply so much out there. And he's done various stories that deal specifically with the sea. Uh, and this one has to do with um, an art collector uh, having, the, having the skull of... Um, or an antique dealer, or whatever, having the skull of Blackbeard, and him getting murdered for some guy that thinks he can use it, and then... So this is also one of the few Hellboys that really the main action takes place in the United States, starts in Massachusetts, and then the main action happens in uh, North Carolina. And uh, you've got, this is in the 80s, in, in the time, so you, you've got the BPRD up and running with other members. You see Agent Abe Sapien there, which makes sense, considering this is uh, uh, oh, one that deals with water. And um, Hellboy coming out, and there's these two guys, the guy that that stole the skull and his partner, and they, they want to summon Blackbeard so that they can make a deal. Basically, you know, uh, they'll give him his head back if he tells them where, uh, they, where they can find some of his treasure. A little bit of uh, the Blackbeard legend. He was a real person, and of course there's legend mixed in there too, is brought. And here's his death at the hands of some pro English privateers, but you'll see there he gets decapitated by, how fittingly, a Highlander. And, um, then the thing, the thing is, like, over the years, like, there was records of where his head was and what people did with it, and eventually becoming lost, and here it is, various people having it, and universities, people drinking beer out of the skull, and all this stuff. So then, we, anyway, we just basically, of course, yeah, Bluebeard very quickly takes care of, um, 
And the guy just summoned him, and it's in the end, and it's, we got Hellboy versus um, Bluebeard, Blackbeard, sorry, I said Bluebeard. And, um, you know, it's sort of what you'd expect, and a nice creepy shot of him finally being dragged down into the into the depths of, I think they're actually only in the lake here, or unless they're just off the coast, yeah, I guess they're just off the coast, uh, by, um, by souls that, um, I guess, uh, he'd, um, either killed himself or damned somehow. And I like dark, inky shots like that, that's Abe, just watching him sort of slowly sinking down, which is always a very, a very scary thing to me. Anyway, I'm not trying to just... Uh, you know, so, oh, here's what happens in every story. Um, so I'll just jump ahead to the next one, and again, I'm not going to try to summarize it, which is sort of what I did there. In the Chapel of Moloch, uh, this is in southern Portugal, 1992, he comes out, and this deals basically with an artist who had always been a painter, and, um, and, uh, we ha and it's drawn on, I guess, the, the paintings of Francisco Goya, I hope you're familiar with him. If not, I'm sure you can look him up and find some stuff, but, but these paintings here are just sort of reminiscent of that. In fact, Hellboy says he he's basically ripping off Goya, um, paintings of demons and that sort of thing. And what we've got here is that he just sort of goes into this, this artist, winds up going to this trance and constructing this large, gigantic, large and gigantic sculpture that turns out to be, um, basically, um, um, in the form of this demon called Moloch. As Hellboy explains, Moloch was one of the old Middle Eastern god monsters. Actually, mentioned in the Bible a couple times, his followers used to sacrifice children to him. Predictably, you know, the, the, the sculpture's going to come alive and Hellboy's going to have to fight it. And I don't have to get into all that, but, um, it, uh, one thing that's great about Hellboy and Mignola, besides just drawing on folklore and, and legend and myth, which is what the main thing is, is he, he uses all sorts of really great tropes and, um, and just really simple, standard things that you find in fiction and that you find in, uh, you know, uh, horror-type fiction, which Hellboy is, or, and, and stuff like that. And one, of course, it's a very old idea, the idea of an artist being possessed or consumed by something that comes out, manifests itself in its art. So I like the story for that. Um, it's sort of predictable, but it's still pretty cool, and, and, um, and the art is consistent with all that. The Mole is a very short story that's basically takes place just before um, the events of Hellboy Darkness Calls, which is one of the arcs that really does center on what Hellboy is doing here in the now and, and uh, what he's doing personally and, you know, stuff that affects him. And it's just sort of a dream sequence he winds up having while staying in the house of an old friend, Harry Middleton, who had actually died some years before. And we see him playing cards with Middleton's ghost as well as some others. Okay, but on to the main story here, which is The Crooked Man. Which, um, I'll read a tiny bit of the intro here, because it is something that I, had crossed my mind a few times as I read various Hellboy volumes. I own them all up to this point. I don't own the latest one, but I will. Uh, and it's, uh, a bit of it is dedicated to, uh, a, a writer that I had heard of, I hadn't read any of his stuff, but I had heard of, named Manly Wade Wellman. Uh, that is his name, Manly Wade Wellman. Not Manly Wade Wellman, like it's a, uh, a nickname or anything like that, who was, um, sort of a pulp writer, American writer, in the early, and, and throughout, well, from the early and into the second half of the 20th century, who, um, uh, had various, um, pulp-type heroes. There was one named John, who, uh, was sort of a musician, and he was based in the Appalachian, uh, mountains, and, um, and he fought monsters and stuff. And here, right here in the intro to this story, uh, Mignola writes, Manly Wade Wellman's character, John, who wandered around the Appalachian mountains playing his guitar and fighting monsters, uh, was a major influence on me when I created Hellboy. Some of the better stories have that aimless wanderer feel, but until The Crooked Man, I never set a story in John's Neck of the Woods. In fact, I'd never, I'd done very few stories set in America and none drawn in American folklore. Oops. So, and that was something that crossed my mind, too. There wasn't any American folklore in there. Um, he, uh, as I've said in other things about Hellboy, he's been all over, around the world and all sorts of great folk folklore. Of, of course, Eastern Europe really dominates, but you, you've got stuff from Africa, South America, Thailand, all over the place. So it does seem a little odd that America gets left out. And um, it's just sort of uh, sort of another interest of mine, uh, legends and folklore from that, from that part of the world. And there is something very genuinely spooky and mysterious and interesting to me about the forest there. I know whenever you think about Appalachian, yeah, I'm, I'm sure you hear the banjos and everybody thinks about um, uh, Deliverance. And, and it does have that feel, but there's more to it that this basically has to do with the witch. Hell, this is a very early Hellboy story as far as early in his chronology goes. This is 1958, and uh, we're in the backwoods here in, Af in, um, in Virginia. And uh, Hellboy's doing one of his sort of like house call things, and we have a woman, uh, we have a young woman that's been affected by what is known as a witch ball, and um, the old, uh, 
uh, and the family there have called on Hellboy to help try to cure her. But what's interesting about this story is that Hellboy sort of winds up taking a back seat to this character that comes in, uh, a character named Tom Farrell, who apparently is sort of a prodigal son. He he'd been gone for 20 years and he's just come back to this moment. He's from this area and he's just come back. And it's just a really fascinating story where um, Hellboy, again, is sort of like the backseat to this interesting character, this wanderer, Tom, who uh, we find out a little about. Um, again, it's sort of an old idea that's been used in lots of stories that I've used in some of my stories that I like a lot. It's about sort of a character who's just come back from a place that he's been away from for a long time. The idea is that he's been running from a... He's basically a good person, but he made a mistake in his past, and he's sort of been running from it ever since, but he can never get away from it. And this story really deals with that, and has deals with the idea, of course, of redemption, and all sorts of things, and has all sorts of great, cool, backwoods elements in there. Um, and then um, the Crooked Man, there's an image of him sort of representing uh, an agent of the devil, sometimes uses the devil. One thing that I thought of when reading this story, they used the term Crooked Man, was, um, I'm sure you've heard the term Old Scratch. Uh, you know, you think of, like, an old American classic story about that, like, uh, the devil and Daniel Webster. But that immediately came to mind when reading the story. Even though there's um, a lot going on here that's different, we still have the whole idea of sort of like a bargain made with the devil, the devil coming to collect. And here we have a very creepy character, the Crooked Man, who only shows up towards the end, of course. And we have all this other stuff going on with witches. And here's the young witch that in his childhood uh, helped lead Tom to this big mistake he made. And he has this lucky bone uh, that he did in a ritual and he tried to run away and how it sort of um, gave him uh, tainted good luck through his life, keeping him alive. As usual, we've got the usual um, monster, gooey sort of fare here, um, uh, sort of like an explosion of um, creepy crawlies attacking Hellboy and Tom there. We've got this great standoff in an old church deep in the, in the woods there um, with an old blind preacher. Uh, another good shot here of... The, of uh, I was going to say old scratch, but there's the crooked man. I've come to collect the idea of collecting souls. Anyway, um, it has a, a it, it, it really in, well written, really draws on uh, folklore from that, uh, again, from that part of the world. And I think it's one of the most satisfying uh, stories I've read, a, a Hellboy, self-contained Hellboy story. And um, it really made this a really worthwhile pickup. Um, and luckily, it's in there first. Um, I thought the other stories were you know, okay, a little lacking, not too interesting. And what's interesting is there, are, even though, like I said, this is a story that um, doesn't really have anything to do with sort of like the main Hellboy mythos and the things that concern him directly, they touch on it a little bit. They just talk about it. Tom is just sort of one of those laid-back characters that has his own things going on. He mentions how he knows who Hellboy is because back ten years earlier, Hellboy's picture had appeared on the cover of Life magazine. Uh, one thing that's very different about the Hellboy universe here, as opposed to the movies, is that Hellboy is not a secret. People know about him uh, and just sort of accept his existence, <laughs> uh, because he's usually not in the public eye so much, because he's in uh, remote places dealing with things like this, that going on. Uh, but the idea is, yes, Hellboy is generally known to the world. Um, and there's just some nice, satisfying, good, you know, normal Hellboy dialogue going in there. About, you know, just that, just how he, you know, takes all this with a grain of salt. It's another day at the office for Hellboy. And um, what's interesting is Tom plays off him in a way, because even though, because Tom has obviously seen some strange stuff in his time, and he's tied into this directly. And I think they just make a very interesting pair, even though they don't really interact much, because it's neither, neither of them are big talkers or anything like that. They're just sort of like, come what may. But there's just some clever little lines that I find uh, funny and satisfying and interesting. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, things like um, Tom pointing out a demon familiar to Hellboy, and Hellboy just going, yeah, I hate those, <laughs> and that sort of thing, almost like they're talking shop. Anyway, I've gone on quite a ways, so I'll, I'll leave you here, and hopefully that wasn't just rambling and summarizing. I'll take a look at it, and we'll see what's what. But I'll be coming at you soon. Raiho, Ryan, and I are going to do some Halloween stuff, some hijinks soon, so keep an eye out for that, too, and I'll see you next time, true believers. Thanks a lot, merci beaucoup.